Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session on the smallholder agriculture in Africa. And uh, we have a lineup of uh, three speakers. Uh, the first one uh, will be on Skype. Uh, but firstly, about myself, uh, my name is Mugove Walter Nika. Um, I am working to promote uh, permaculture in schools in Eastern and Southern Africa. So we use uh, uh, schools as an entry point into communities. And um, uh, we have uh, work going on in Zimbabwe, Malawi, Kenya, Uganda, and uh, Zambia. Uh, so I am very much a, a part of this effort to uh, strengthen smallholder agriculture in Africa. Um, and uh, our first uh, speaker this afternoon is uh, Dr. Abigail Conrad. Uh, she is unfortunately not able to be with us uh, uh, this afternoon, so she will be speaking from the United States. Uh, she is an applied anthropo anthropologist and uh, she has got an interest in um, uh, development issues and um, she has spent some time evaluating uh, agriculture and food sec security programs in Eastern and Southern Africa. So she was in Malawi uh, 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 to do a study on the benefits and limitations of permaculture uh, in central Malawi, and she's going to share with us uh, the results of that um, research. Hello, Abigail. Hello. Welcome. I'll just uh, introduce you to I've just introduced you to, to the group, and we, okay. yes, so we uh, pass it over to you to share with us on the presentation on the benefits and limitations of permaculture in central Malawi. Okay, great, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully that will work. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. 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 Um, in addition 
low external inputs and intercropping. And for inclusion in the permaculture sample group, as a part of the study, we had three criteria. One was that they had to self-identify as practicing permaculture. Two was that they had to be exposed to permaculture through a permaculture organization. And three, that they had to intentionally use permaculture um, in one place. Um, so we worked with 16 households that implement permaculture who often maintained conventional production um, in staple fields. And these were all of the farmers in the area that were using permaculture at the time. So it wasn't, it's not why, was not widely adopted then. Um, and we also worked with 28 households that only use conventional production who live in the same or adjacent villages. And we worked across 10 different villages. The average household size was five, and on average they own just over one hectare of agricultural land. So we conducted research for nine months during 2011 and 2012. I worked with a local research team. Jeffrey Malongo to teach, Soma Chacha and M.M. Chiteka were the folks that I worked with, we used a variety of techniques, including observation, interviews, focus groups, um, and surveys. And we did a food security measure and 24-hour diary. To give a little bit of context, farming in Malawi focuses on maize production during the one rainy season, <coughs> staple fields, and people who have low-lying um, land cultivate vegetables in gardens during the season. Most of the crops grown in Malawi today. Learning the design concepts, those with formal training learned about it in courses 
um, but those without formal training learned about the design system more implicitly. So farmers adopted permaculture for different reasons, and often each household had multiple reasons for buying. Farmers evaluated permaculture within their local context based on their personal experiences and perceptions, and often only conditionally adopted permaculture in order to test it and further evaluate it. Most of them adopted it in order to um, address tangible, to get tangible benefits solve material household problems that they face, like limited access to food and high income crops. And we found that permaculture adoption was really a multi-year process. Farmers often started um, on a very small scale, like you can see in the picture in the top left. Um, and then as they learned and they gained experience and more motivation over time, they would incrementally expand um, their, the intensity and the, ex, how extensively they used in permaculture. So we found that farmers used permaculture to varying degrees, which I categorized into low, medium, and high levels based on a permaculture practice measure that I developed. We found a few things that were related to the varying levels of practice, particularly relating to education, Farmers who learned about permaculture from, um, or those in the high, the high practice level, um, on average, learned about permaculture from more sources, um, more and more types of sources, and they typically had formal um, permaculture training. So while formal training in permaculture was not necessary for farmers to adopt permaculture, it may have been more significant um, for helping farmers to intensively use it. Um, and also, those in the high level, on average, had um, someone in the household with more standard education. So someone typically had finished secondary school in the household for in that group. Um, and also, the permaculture practice scores were correlated with the <coughs> permaculture. So it helped to practice longer, but um, high application of permaculture was not dependent on a particular number of years of practice. And we found that other um, household factors like physical capital, land size, and age were not related to permaculture practice levels. So a number of the practices that permaculture farmers used, conventional farmers also used them. Um, but they would use one or two of these practices um, in their production. So the difference was in the extent and combination of use for permaculture farmers. Over 70% of the permaculture farmers used all of the practices listed on the slide here that targeted soil and water conservation, agrobiodiversity, and resource use. Um, so here are some examples of farmers implementing different practices in their yards, like recycling rainwater and stocking plants, and growing diverse types of crops, the like vegetables, legumes, fruits, tubers, and different tree varieties. Farmers also used resources differently. Um, the conventional farmers purchased fertilizer, hired labor, and bought seeds. And the permaculture farmers really only purchased the seeds for their inputs. Um, and even though they didn't have the other costs like fertilizer or hired labor, um, the seed costs were not insignificant for men. <laughs> fertilizer and hybrid basic purchases are often male dominated decisions in this context. And the permaculture farmers reported more egalitarian seed purchasing decisions for their permaculture plots. Um, likely because they were purchasing seeds in small quantities for crops that they primarily intended to keep for home consumption. Um, so, due to amateur cropping and growing year round, the permaculture farmers had um, three times the agrobiodiversity that conventional farmers did. On average, the permaculture farmers had were growing 30 crop varieties in their permaculture plots 
compared to conventional farmers who grew tech in their fields and gardens combined. Additionally, for each food group, the permaculture farmers grew statistically significantly more crop varieties than the conventional farmers. And I also found that diet diversity scores were correlated with agrobiodiversity for both conventional and permaculture farmers. So along with increased food access from their own production and using money that they saved to not buy vegetables to buy other foods like meat and fish, most of the permaculture farmers reported some diet change since the beginning of permaculture. We used 24-hour uh, diet recalls to get this information, and we used a diet diversity score that predicts the micronutrient adequacy of diets. So this score showed that, um, on average, permaculture farmers had slightly higher diet diversity than the conventional farmers, and it was a statistically significant difference. And we found that permaculture was related to diet diversity when controlling for other households characteristics like physical capital and land size. We see in the bar graph on the bottom that most of the farmers in both groups had medium diet diversity. And there was the difference with permaculture um, really at the margins. So there was a smaller portion of permaculture farmers who had low diet diversity and a higher portion with high diet diversity. And we found similar results with food security. Um, that on average, the permaculture farmers had slightly better food security scores compared to conventional farmers. And the difference was small but statistically significant. And permaculture was still related to food security when controlling for household characteristics. <coughs> and here again, most of the farmers in both groups had moderate food insecurity. But the difference with permaculture was on the severe end. So a smaller portion of permaculture farmers experienced severe food insecurity compared to the conventional farmers. So due to the increased access to food from implementing permaculture, it may have helped to prevent farmers from experiencing severe food insecurity. So farmers experienced benefits from permaculture because they used it in a way that addressed critical household problems that they faced. Broadly, it helped them to improve their adaptive capacity to deal with problems cushion vulnerability. It helped farmers to improve their skills and expand their skill, the tools they had available to them to solve problems. It also helped them to build on their existing livelihood strategies and to decrease their dependence on markets for regular food purchases and agricultural inputs. So along with the benefits, all of the permaculture farmers experience different problems when implementing permaculture. The specific constraints that they faced in permaculture used changed over time, whether it was um, brittle fuel because they were doing something different and seemingly strange or had limited access to, um, to water. So initially, farmers faced resource constraints like limited labor and water and also had limited access to information and based social stigma. During implementation, social constraints remained and then environmental uh, constraints arose like poor rainfall and really roaming livestock in villages that decimated gardens. And during future expansion, resources and information problems came back, um, like farmers lacked enough manure to cultivate large fields um, and didn't have enough information. And we're skeptical that permaculture practices could really work on a large stable field. So I want to emphasize that there are constraints and limitations to farmers' permaculture use. <coughs> the scope of impact of permaculture was largely limited to the household level, um, and the benefits were really incremental, and it took time for farmers to realize benefits. The problems that permaculture farmers Based were deeply rooted in structural constraints, and they really faced layered vulnerabilities um, that were complex. And using permaculture did not solve um, the many critical other critical determinants of well-being that are shaped by the broader political economy, like economic opportunity, access to quality health care and education services, and social and economic inequality. So it's important to critically evaluate the scope and scale of the programs and activities in order to improve their effectiveness. So in summary, the farmers implemented permaculture practices over several years in a risk-averse way. Many of the farmers reported experiencing multi 
and environments. Permaculture education, skills, and practices helped farmers to expand their adaptive capacity and mitigate risk and address food access and farming problems. Farmers benefited from permaculture because they used practices that addressed household constraints. However, farmers faced constraints to permaculture implementation, and permaculture practice largely did not alter farmer systemic risk and vulnerability within Malawi's agricultural system. So, in summary, I would disagree with the common permaculture saying and say that all of the world's problems cannot be solved in the garden. <coughs> and I want to give thanks to everyone in Hawaii, especially the farmers and my research team. And if you'd like to learn more about permaculture in Malawi, here's a list of some great organizations. You can find links to their websites on my website, along with more information about my research. And if you're involved in permaculture development, Please contribute um, through a survey to a current research project that I'm involved with at regenda.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We have got uh, time for uh, questions. Okay. So I suggest that. Um, um, uh, you, you say your question, then I'll repeat it to Abigail, and then she can respond to, to, to the questions. So we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, I think we'll take one at a time. Yes. I'm wondering whether permaculture helped with gender issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, Did it Abigail? help to empower women, essentially? Mm -hmm. Abigail? Uh, there is a question on whether permaculture helped on um, gender issues in terms of women empowerment. What, what was your finding on that? Okay. Um, I don't think that it necessarily helped to um, increase women's empowerment. Um, the projects that I worked with were not necessarily targeting that. Um, but what, what was interesting is because um, it was a new technology, um, so it didn't have all of the gender um, kind of implications as conventional agriculture. So um, women were able to make more decisions about the production around their homes um, because it didn't have a market a market focus and because it was a new technology. Um, those norms around the gender division of labor and decision making weren't really there. Um, so like I said, there was um, some more quality with decision making about um, which grow and seed purchases, um, and also about uh, what to do with the crops. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Just wondering, were there any examples of entrepreneurship and the farmers coming together to create other economic drivers? In those, in those regions as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question, Abigail, uh, were there any examples of entrepreneurship where uh, farmers were trying to get more benefits from what they were uh, growing? Mm -hmm. um, there was a little bit. Um, in one of the villages, some of the, um, the drivers of permaculture were teenage boys, actually, and they did come together and um, they have a business to um, crochet plastics into like rugs <coughs> and bats and things. Um, and they work together to get chickens and sell eggs um, at their homestead. Um, some of the other, one of the other groups were interested in doing that and some of the farmers were um, starting to farm together um, in a garden with the hopes of selling uh, in different markets. Um, but besides those two examples, there weren't too many cases of that. Um, except that farmers didn't use the the crops that they grew um, in their yards to sell. To the um, and some kids that helped them to get money for their school fees and things. It was helpful. There, there is a slight connection pro uh, problem. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, thanks. It's uh, solved. Um, you said at the end uh, what won't work. You said that uh, you can't solve all the world's problems in a garden. So what do you think will work? What is your regenerative development recommendation? Uh, 
Abigail? Yeah. So what is your recommendation for regenerative development? So I think that um, yeah, there are many things that permaculture practices can do well. Um, and all the things that I talked about I think are important. Um, and using permaculture was you know, helpful for farmers and um, in a lot of different ways. So I don't mean to diminish that, um, but I think that um, sort of the scope of action as much be looked at. Um, there are times when um, one needs to look at policy and you know the economic and political situations, and um, that projects also need to address those things. Um, it's not you know an easy question. I don't have um, a single answer. But I just mean to say that um, people are really constrained um, in their their everyday lives and what they can do on their own. And sometimes, um, I think permaculture projects and practices have a, t a tendency to be very household focused. So thinking about ways that um, permaculture can be used to bring communities together and um, and that organizations can help, um, you know, with advocacy and and things, and working with other organizations to address other sectors um, beyond just the household level. Thank you. Uh, we still have uh, room for a few more questions. Yes? Hi. Um, I'd like to know if she looked at the economics, because obviously the conventional farmers were using fertilizer, there was obviously a cost there. So was food production cheaper for, for the permaculture farmers? Um, did you look at the economics of uh, uh, pro production, uh, comparing the, the permaculture farmers with the <coughs> conventional farmers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did somewhat. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to um, control for land size. So if you're not looking at the land size, the permaculture production was much cheaper. It was really a fraction of the cost of the conventional farming, um, since they weren't buying fertilizer. Um, and also because they weren't hiring labor, the, um, the labor inputs were spread out over the seasons more consistently than in conventional farming. And because the land sizes were so small. Um, but if the, the seed costs were to remain as high as they were for, you know, like an eighth of an acre on a whole acre, it would be pretty expensive um, and it wouldn't have that much cost saving. So um, in this case, the access to seed were, was really the, the issue and is something that needed to be addressed more for farmers to be able to implement on a large scale. Um, and part of that is just is because there aren't a lot of variety of seeds available in Maui, um, and that made some of these other diverse crops expensive to find seeds for. So it was cheaper, but it's a little bit of a qualified answer. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. Uh, one more question, Amy? Yes. It's to follow up with something she just mentioned, access to seed. So I was wondering if uh, because that has come out of the project, whether they are thinking about seed bank uh, work so that they can make save their own seeds and then bring it back to a production scale for farmers. Um, what is your comment about uh, access to seeds in terms of the uh, farmers that, that you uh, uh, talked to in the study? The issues of access to seeds. Yeah. Yeah, so it was Yeah, it seems we, we 
Um, and because Zimbabwe has been going through a lot of challenges, they've lost a lot of really good people to other countries. So we wanted to work with Fundit and I and see what we could do to kind of reinforce what they're doing. The second partner <coughs> was our um, organic certification partner, which is the Zimbabwe Organic Producers and Promoters Association. Sorry, I'm just trying to round. Um, so we wanted to look at, look at applying permaculture to organic markets. Um, so, am I changing the what's Can you? Okay, yeah. So, so we identified um, our markets are domestic, by the way. So, so we identified that a lot of the market potential was around Harare. So, we wanted to look at the Mashallahland East, which is this province here, because we also wanted to test our methodology and be able to demonstrate to policymakers why permaculture and organic certification would work. So we, you know, we, we range from the semi-arid to, to, to areas of higher, higher rainfall. Um, when we started to develop the program in 2009, as uh, it was <coughs> particularly fragile, um, and just before the um, was great sense of humour, but, but it's, it, it, was pretty, it was pretty desperate. Um, so we wanted to look at the situation first. Um, and this is common to a lot of, uh, of, of people, of, of, of situations, um, pre-existing situations in, in sub-Saharan Africa. High dependence on agriculture for the main means of livelihood. The predominance of maize monocropping in Zim, actually last year I think it was uh, 73 kgs of, of maize per hectare. And everybody's very obsessed with maize, so we speak to policymakers in terms of maize. Um, We've got a rate of land degradation at 46%, and, and, and even though Zim had one of the highest, um, best healthcare systems and the best education systems, in Zim their uh, literacy rate is still higher than in the UK. But unfortunately, uh, we're now seeing life expectancy for women at 34. Uh, I'm not going to talk to all of these bullets because. Uh, so, in, in any fragile system, we've got massive. Uh, uh, massive uh, brain drain, huge dependence on food aid by the majority of smallholder farmers, which is absurd. Um, and as any fragile state, uh, especially around uh, election times, land and food use is a political tool. So a lot of seed, which is totally inappropriate, and fertilizer gets subsidized around <coughs> times and <coughs> excuse us. So it would seem like a fairly unlikely environment for organic demand, but there's a lot of change in Zen. There are a lot of very large cars with private number plates sitting outside the airport. Um, there's, a, there's, a very, there's a growth of this status to conscious middle class. Uh, a growing expat population. Um, the gradual return of, the, of, ex, of um, the diaspora is really interesting for us in the organic sector. Um, and this is a key for us here. I mean, this. The health concerns of the chronically underpaid professional classes, teachers, healthcare workers. How do they afford good quality, organic, or natural food? So we've often, you'll see in odd places, there's issues of premium, which is highlighted because we're still dealing with the ethics of the premium in Zim and whether that's necessary. We, we have healthy disagreements on these things. So we've... So there are a lot of export come in, imports coming in from South Africa, and smallholders are net recipients of food aid, but they're not essentially not using um, fertilizer and pesticide or any chemicals because they can't afford to use it. And since the state went into this level of fragility, there are, there's very little subsidization outside of election periods. Um, we believed that we could actually increase <coughs> The income and therefore the status of permaculture producers or natural producers um, by turning them on to the to to to, to um, by by increasing uh, livelihood opportunities through organic certification. So our methodology was permaculture practices and very much the ethics and the market mechanism for us was the certification. So we we started off working with the um, government extension services to identify a number of. Um, key, we don't really want to call them lead farmers, uh, but I guess it's kind of that system. Um, in each of the eight, there's nine districts here, nine districts, but we worked in, set in eight of them. Um, and for, they had to undergo a certain, a, a, a 
number of permaculture principles and tests um, over a two-day two workshop, and then they were visited. And then we selected, I think, four from each district. And then their job was to go and select some peers, and then they were going. So we were going to train at the centre in Harare. So so Fambids and I has a 22 hectare farm outside of Harare, training farm, and. Um, Key farmers were going to be elected by each association and they would come to the training each month. So we had 13 months of initial training, or 13 months that were of a week each. Um, and then there would be the horizontal transfer to the rest of the association members. So we started off with 18 donors. I know mean, it's about permaculture, let alone organic certification. So, so we got enough funding for 18 months so we could test test the ground, demonstrate to them what could actually be achieved in that short period. Um, and then we increased that in phase two to 1,189 farmers. We had a decrease in women only because as, as, as the income potential of the women increased, we saw more men coming to the project, which is, which is not unusual. And then the other is our, what, where we're aiming for next. It's a current project. Um, so we, uh, we started working with the extension officers because the extension officers are massively undercapacitated. I think anybody who works in Africa kind of knows the situation. Very demoralized, undercapacitated, no transport, um, very basic uh, education in terms of conventional agriculture, which leads pretty much to nowhere. Um, and we worked with the traditional authorities to bring them on board. So when we began to see the first associations doing really well and accessing markets, and the other associations really struggling, one thing that stood out was that the, the successful ones had a very, very supportive traditional chi uh, uh, tribal chief. Um, and so we took all of their tri tribal leaders on an exchange to the one supportive uh, group and their tribal leader. And within a week, within a month, sorry, we had, um, all of the traditional leaders had allocated virgin land next to rivers and other water sources. So we had all of our farmers coming in through organic certification very, very quickly. I'm not sure if any people are aware that for organic conversion it takes up to three years. And that's part of the standard in, in Zimbabwe. So we wanted to get farmers coming through that really quickly. And we could do that within six months if they were working virgin land. So I'm going to whip through these because these are all permaculture techniques, and so you know it's it's the usual kind of the trainings, the, the 13 odd <coughs> trainings are both market but also natural resource based. Um, so <coughs> we worked with Q on, um, on on natural pest management, so not only predators but but also looking at indigenous plants and doing um, doing chemical testing. Um, and selection for uh, useful uh, pesticidal plants. Usual beekeeping. Uh, processing and value addition has been really useful and essential for um, not just for food security, but also ensuring consistency of supply to market when uh, at, at certain very dry periods. Um, and then one way we've tested how successful the farmers have been is obviously providing small amounts, a small loan per association, but also measuring how their priorities change through the period of the project by looking at what they then reinvest uh, in, what, what, whether it's processing equipment or improving seed, etc., etc. So it's a way of our measuring uh, how they're doing. So the standards, there were no standards in Zim when we started. Um, so we, we looked at, um, at developing the standards based on the participatory guarantee scheme, otherwise known as the PGS, um, and we successfully incorporated those into the standards of association in Zimbabwe very, very quickly, and they've now been accepted by the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements. And uh, how, it, how it works, the PGS, is it is very participatory. It's not expensive for the party uh, certification. So we have, let's say we've got, this, is this, this one ward, and these are two separate associations, and they're doing their participatory you know, boundary mapping. Um, and, and, and between them, they also developed a series of sanctions, quite tough on each other. Um, what would happen if somebody was caught smoking in the garden, or if there was a dog in the garden, or 
you know, something, something like that, if somebody was urinating somewhere, not outside of. So, so they, they develop these sanctions and they, they measure and monitor each other. And then our partner Zopper then goes once a year and um, does the compliance monitoring with them and that enables them to maintain either access or main, and or maintain their certification. So then we developed, um, all of our farmers are now fully certified, so they're now able to use this, the, um, the, the trademarks and organics um, label for their produce. But new farmers coming into the system um, will be able to, if they still have to convert over that three year period, will be using the Zim Natural brand. Um, if there are issues around that, but I mean, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's still yet to be used. We did some tests, um, we did some soil testing because the level of um, input use in Zim is so low we actually tested the soils between uh, <coughs> conventional fields and virgin lands, and actually the, 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 the levels of inputs, the levels of uh, residues were, were negligible. So we could actually say that you know, all lands within Zim, other than that which is indus you know, farmed industrially, actually could, could work under this, um, if we were allowed to say such things. Um, so we, we, we then moved on to our markets, and we looked at how many different time are there? Are you timing me? Yeah. Okay. So, so we, we were interested in looking what were, the, what were some of the constraints that farmers face in terms of the various policies, uh, but, but including corruption and so forth, either enabling or disabling. You know, even the Environmental Management Agency, there are issues. So, so there are many challenges that organic farmers or natural farmers face. Primarily people just see, and, and also buyers, uh, but people especially in um, I the agricultural sector, uh, the ministry. Um, do you consider you know, something that just peasant farmers do because they can't afford to have the, they can't afford inputs? So we looked at where, what the markets were actually saying, where the demand was, and we've started to drive this demand. We have a relationship with a South African supermarket chain that the farmers are producing for directly. Um, but some of the best prices they're getting are obviously where the, where the value chain is shorter. So with their local markets, schools and hospitals and clinics, they're getting really good prices from there. But obviously it's not as sexy as going to pick and pay or going to export. And some have tried export, but some contract farming didn't work out. Not a great surprise. But also looking at new input companies that are developing. So people who are actually producing worm compost. Um, Zimbabwe Fertilizer Company, a big fertilizer company, is now registering its fertile, first organic fertilizer. So it's really interesting to see this whole thing moving. Um, so we, we learned that the organic market is, at, the, the market is demanding diversity. It's not they're not interested in the monocultures, they're not interested in the maize that's being produced. Um, so the demand, the demand is substantial, and we're really struggling at the moment to supply this demand. We've got just over 2,000, we've just got over, over 1,000 farmers, and we need more farmers coming into the supply chain. And it's really interesting to see these opportunities. So we've now got the UNDP is now <coughs> training up more organic farmers. I think uh, they've they've trained up another 3,000. Well, they haven't trained them, but they've got through certification. So in all, I think we've got something like 8,000 new <coughs> organic farmers coming into the supply chain. And as, as a result of our research on the markets and what actually the farmers are, are beginning to produce in terms of their yields, which I'll talk to you in a second. Uh, we've also at the four, at the, uh, we've got four um, zero energy pool pack sheds. I haven't got time to go through what they are, but obviously the farmers are able to pack, store, and hold produce in order to increase the consistency of supply to market over over periods. And they're in those. I haven't got time to go through that because I've only got a couple minutes left. I probably won't talk about the policies too much, but where the policies are constraining is that the. There's, there's not recognition of, 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 of organic farming or which I, I would prefer to call it agroecology. So it means that there are, there are huge disincentives for uh, investment. Um, the finance sector doesn't recognize 
uh, organic agriculture or agroecology and therefore credit is not available to farmers working in that sector, but anyway credit's not very well structured for farmers anywhere in the world. Um, and, and, and also without support from the Ministry of Agriculture who are beginning to come on board, then we have extension officers who are just not qualified to train in anything other than conventional agriculture, which is not, which is not fit for what's really happening in the environment. Um, so farmers and their own production. So we got 44 fully certified. We increased uh, over the first, actually over the first 18 months, they increased the agrobiodiversity by 122%, and they yield by 290%, despite 50% lower rainfall than we expected. Um, and we had a 44 percent inc increase in value addition, which again is in really important for food security and consistency for markets. Thanks, Rod. Um, so we've got, we, they're producing for eight wholesale, wholesalers and supermarkets, colleges and hospitals, traders, seed houses, uh, eight, eight are producing worms for the vermicomposting um, company. They're producing 80 tons of vermicompost per month and they've got the capacity to go to 120. So we want farmers buying more and feeding into this supply chain so that the inputs, I mean it's part of the part of our policy strategy as well to, to demonstrate how organic sector is not saying we don't need markets, we don't need inputs, we do. So let's not pretend and let's not try and exclude, because when we try and exclude, we are actually policy makers are just closing us down completely. So we want to demonstrate that this actually um, can generate incomes and actually is good for national and uh, for, for economics, whether we disagree or disagree with all of that. Um, as a result, uh, we've had another 8,104 8, farmers entering and 440 hectares of land locally certified, which is the first locally certified land in Zim. We did, well, I mean, we wanted to find out where the farmers, how the farmers felt about this process. So we looked at, um, we looked at the process of most significant change. We asked them what the most significant changes had, had tech, what, what significant changes most had most affected them. <coughs> and we we asked them to identify areas, these subdomains, where they felt the, the most impacted them. And and some of our results were quite interesting where men and women gravitated to. But actually what we what we were really interested in was from, from our perspective we felt that that, that the, the environment would come first if we could assist them and work with them to change their relationship with their environment, that their, um, their, their ability to earn an income would be increased. And therefore, their, the, the, the way they were perceived, their self-esteem and all of those elements would actually be increased. And actually, the way they responded was exactly the, exactly the opposite. For them, this came first, which we were thrilled with. Um, the, uh, the, this came second. So. So, so their relationship with the environment changed and their relationship with the, with they were able to start trading. And then this came last. And that came, that for us has led to lots of questions. We're not quite sure how to respond to that or whether we should respond. Um, but then what I think what we found most interesting is how people began, so these are the, some of the subdomains in their stories that were transcribed, translated and transcribed and coded. <coughs> and then we found out where exactly they started making the links themselves between domains. And for us that was really interesting and as the, pro as the program continues, what we'd like to see is more links appearing as people start linking the, the, the domains between people, um, environment and uh, income. I haven't, got I haven't got time to go through all my learning, or our, our collective learning. Um, I think we realised that we needed to include the private sector. It's something that kind of made us all do this a little bit, um, but we realised that actually policy doors were beginning to open as we started to take a much more inclusive approach <coughs> and not shut areas down. Um, <coughs> our training <coughs> didn't work as well using a centre model. It's working much better now. We're using more exchanges and much more horizontal peer transfer. Um, go next. Uh, we're doing. Uh, we're hoping to, with further funding from Comet Relief, go into the third phase to get the farmers really 
uh, working solidly around the pack sheds so that they work together and develop their business skills and market development. Uh, much more participatory approaches to, to including other new members as well, opening up access to the supply chains for more value. Um, that's the next phase. <laughs> and really for us, Zimbabwe, we, we believe that this has massive potential and does that domestic market, does re represent an equitable market-based mechanism. And it's what all donors are fascinated about, markets, markets, markets. And what we're trying to do is hold on to our ethics, but also help farmers and ease them into a process where they can engage with markets in, 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 a, in a more constructive way. And, and for us as NGOs to actually be much more constructive about how we understand how we can help farmers <coughs> uh, interact with those markets, um, remembering those ethics. Uh, care people care fair share, and it's something that we something we really struggle with around markets. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, George. We've got uh, about five minutes for questions. So any questions? Yes. How did you deal with um, we thought it was going to take much longer than it actually did um, and, and primarily I think because because on rain fed lands the productivity is so poor that as soon as you begin to put something back it, it just it did spring to life and a lot of people warned us that it would take you know at least 18 months two years before we could actually re-inject that or you know and, and, and actually it didn't take long at all I mean in the first in the first 18 months productivity rose by 90 percent so, but you're still recognising you're starting from a very, very low baseline. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. I just want to ask about the, the almost economic, because you talked a little bit about the kind of premium of organic. Yeah. But I guess there's a kind of down, there's, there's another side to that which I'd have thought would be more attractive in such an environment, which is actually the low input cost. Yeah. And then actually, it's almost low input costs rather than higher sales costs that actually might tip, it, tip things that way. Yeah, and, and that's where our disagreement comes in. So, so uh, Disagreement I, with? Our, our disagreement, uh, I mean, there's a number of partners, so we all have opinions on mm. this. And there are promises made to farmers about premiums, and farmers move in a direction because there's the promise of the premium. But if you look at the, 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 reduced, um, the reduced costs in cost of production <coughs> um, in terms of inputs, farmers are actually pretty profitable. And, and also, even without a premium, they're getting good prices. They're still getting preferential agreements with, with buyers because their produce is actually really good. Um, and, uh, but but as, we increase, as we increase the efficiency of the value chain through pack sheds, we begin to put infrastructure in place. And farmers are trained to take roles, marketing roles and financial roles within each hub. Then we have to look at who, how to cost that into, into the value chain. And so at some stage, because the economy, and, and unless we're looking at massive economies of scale, we are looking at increasing economies of scale, but by bringing more farmers in, now that takes quite a lot to organise, and somebody's got to do that. So who pays for that, I think, is the, is the question we're now asking ourselves. Um, it's, it's yet to be resolved, that one. <laughs>
steel pumps. So, you know, obviously it's not what we all want, but the cost of soil is still enormous mm -hmm. in Africa, and we're still not seeing any, any young businesses uh, developing in Africa which are promoting um, small-scale solar equipment. I think that's what we say. We'll have the last two questions, <laughs> one from the front, yeah, Anne, and then we'll end, uh, okay, we'll end at the last two at the back there. Is this program changing the status of farming, particularly in the eyes of young people, beginning to see it as a real career, not as something that's only fit for peasants? Well, that's what we're Could you repeat the question? Is, 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 is organic farming attracting attracting youth with yes. the idea of new opportunities uh, uh, is through? Is it raising the status is it raising of farming the status? as an occupation? Um, I think that that was, our, that was our hypothesis that it would. Um, I think we are fighting that because new farmers are coming in and we're finding more younger farmers coming in as well. Interestingly, the younger farmers are also interested in the value addition, the processing, and the marketing mm -hmm. side. So we're, we're by, by the development of each hub. So mm -hmm. the moment it's a pack shed, but it, it's, it sits on a quarter of a hectare of land. So mm -hmm. we're getting the fencing, to be, I'm talking to a donor in a couple of days' time about getting the fencing around mm -hmm. each, so that we can actually bring um, agri organic agri-dealers in and, and, and they can do demonstrations there. So you begin to have this organic hub of activity <coughs> where you've got green enterprises coming in mm -hmm. and startups and actually it's the younger generation that are much more interested in, in that side of it. It is about creating opportunity in the rural areas mm -hmm. to stop that, that loss of knowledge and that migration of youth mm -hmm. to, to hopeless large urban centres. Thank you. Uh, we'll have the last two from the back. Uh, yes? Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to, on a really practical nuts and bolts level, the, how do you manage the volume of data that you, yeah, from a thousand odd farmers in Zimbabwe to 50% of that on your slideshow, how does that data get recorded and how does it move? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, there are a number of tools that we use. So we use the usual, usual quantitative baseline, phase min, and line surveys to look at how things are changing. And we ask specific questions of women or new entrants into the process as well to look at issues of inclusivity. And then the MSC, the most significant change is, is obviously a really nice way that we can capture farmers' opinions to get the qualitative and also look at how the relationships are changing uh, with the project between the, and I think one of the challenges when I say with the project is exactly that, is farmers are still seeing these things as projects rather than their own. And, and, and our third phase is very much now to, to look at pulling back and doing all the business skills development of these hubs so that it's, it's there. Um, but managing data is monstrous. Yeah, I mean, it's written yeah. down on bits of paper and then somebody has to and people lose bits, and then interns come in and they and they cut out entire pieces of, of a survey before they go out again, and so you get stuff that, that's not comparable. Uh, and, and, and very often we've got too much data. I mean, large NGOs I know haven't got enough. We've got too much. We're trying to capture what our donors want, but also what we think we need. And at the end of it, you think, oh, do we really need that? So, yeah, it's something I'm working on now with partners and in a new framework to really look at what we do need. We are looking to what we're saying we're going to change <laughs> and what we'd like to see change. Okay, let's have the last. Hi, thanks for Um I at some point in the, in the beginning you mentioned that it's quite hard to get <coughs> donors um, to support projects, um agriculture projects specifically. Why do you think that is? To get who to? To get donors to support permaculture. Why is it a hard sell? I think partly because I mean, it's something that was something that Jonathan Porritt said today I, I, earlier was about um, about permaculture used to be about kind of removing yourself from from what you, from what was happening that you, you wanted to kind of exclude yourself from. But for those of us who are working in permaculture in other places, it's very much about jumping in and very much about about facilitating change and and how permaculture can help people to facilitate change. But it's still it's still got that old image. Mm -hmm. and, and and I think we need to change that. And it's funny if you call something an organic certification project, you, you get donors very interested in it, like if it was fair, a fair trade project. So we really we are still stuck there, which is part of why I think as as, as members of the permaculture research group network, it's 
really important that we now start looking at building a more solid and robust evidence base to say <laughs> this is why it works. While you're dividing food security from environmental management to, to poverty alleviation and economic development, actually, this can actually be achieved through these projects when we look in a, in a much more multifunctional way, a much more holistic way. Uh, at, at the provision of and the facilitation of services and development. And that's not happening. And we're not shouting loud enough, but partly because we don't have enough of a solid evidence base. We're all collecting something different. Mm -hmm. And we all need to kind of develop something like a, a common, well, something we're working on in the research group, a common platform, where we actually identify what it is we want to collect. And we all feed that into a global platform and shout louder to the policy makers about the value of what we're doing. Uh, let's give a final round of applause to George. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we now move into the final uh, segment, uh, which is on um, unlocking sustainable livelihoods uh, with a uh, close look at the role of key or gardens uh, in Africa. And we've got two. Uh, colleagues that uh, will share the stage on this. Uh, I'll start with uh, Sheila. Uh, Sheila has got a background in development studies and um, she is working with uh, Sende Cow um, organization and um, which is working in uh, Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, West Africa, Bangladesh. But Sheila has spent a lot of time working in Uganda. She has traveled and lived in Uganda for a very long time. And then uh, we have Daniel uh, from uh, Geneva. He lives just near Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, he has got a background in anthropology. Uh, and uh, he founded an organization called <coughs> the Green Dots, which is working to uh, promote a sustainable livelihoods uh, in West Africa mainly. That's uh, the area where they've been working a lot and he, this is where they got into partnership with the uh, send a car so they are going to share with us experiences of working with key or gardens uh, in uh, different parts of Africa so uh, over to you you just have to change computers because the, we, we are going to show it the movie and it seems to work better on a smaller computer so my name is Daniel, I am from Geneva, so uh, English is not my mother tongue, so excuse me for the accent and everything. Uh, today we are going to speak about Keyhole Gardens. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of something that's well known in permaculture, uh, but uh, with Sedeca we are doing it in a slightly different way. Uh, have, has any one of you heard about Keyhole Gardens? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Can you raise your hand? So maybe you have heard also about the Sendaka way of making them. Uh, maybe not, so we're gonna see what we can share uh, for knowledge. Uh, uh, so, yeah, the, those gardens, they, we can say they have purposes, they have principles, and, the, uh, and they work with partnerships. We're gonna see this in detail uh, during the presentation. Um, but I, I, I thought the best way was to show this, this little movie first, so you can have a, a look not only of about what is yes. what is a keyhole garden, but also how it relates to the, the daily life of women in uh, Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso being one of the countries we have adapted the uh, keyhole gardens to, but there are some other examples that we can share also. So let's start with this movie. In the video, it's only three minutes.
just say that um, we're looking at this case study. We've seen two really nice examples that were case studies from places. So uh, we've been given the opportunity to give you a case study that's more looking at one entry point into smallholder um, farming, which is through the use of keyhole gardens. And you'll see examples from different parts of Africa. And also an example from Bangladesh where some learning was taken that had been developed with farmers in Eastern Africa. And we had the opportunity to go and work with some farmers in Bangladesh. And uh, they adapted the principles of the gardens that we'd been using to suit what they wanted to do with them. So we wanted to show them how they sort of uh, transition between different countries and different cultures and different situations also took place. But we seem to be having a small yeah. snag with the film, which un is unfortunate because it was showing when we yeah. did the rehearsal at lunchtime. So. Let's, let's try another table with that. Uh, it's, it's the You go to project computer rather than project video because it's back computer you're projecting. If you're behind the bar mark. Oh, we've done it. That's. That all sort of works. That all works. Could you just start sharing, please? Yeah. It's about stories, so maybe you can just start sharing the story without the computer. Can you switch it on? Let's go. Is that all right? Let's use the time wisely and share the story to start the, the session, if that's good. Yeah, I, I just wanted you to have a visual of those gardens. So before we start actually <laughs> explaining things, you can just have a look of what it is. Maybe, yeah, if we have the presentation. <laughs> But we're still going to need the, the, the bowler to, to have some pictures and stuff. Yeah, it's 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 before it, maybe it works. So uh, the Keel Garden is mentioned a little bit uh, in the Permaculture Manual of Bill Mollison, but he speaks more about the uh, keyhole beds as uh, a way to create vegetable gardens. Uh, but the main principle is uh, to have access of the vegetable beds. And our, the way we are doing the keyhole gardens is a little bit different. So now we get, we're going to have a picture. Uh, like in the, in the, in the Bill Mollison uh, book, uh, there is the keyhole garden is the center here, and you have all the keyhole path leading to the vegetable beds around. It's more about access and, uh, and improving the, the way people will uh, service the garden. And with our keyhole gardens, we are uh, using that principle also, but we are uh, turning it uh, in a, um, in a, with different uh, principles and, and uh, systems. So, uh, if we describe a little bit the garden, shall, shall we? Yeah. So you can have a visual. We will uh, show you how it works. Uh, Just in case it wasn't going to work, we brought along our blue Peter. For those of you in the UK, sort of um, version of the garden. Now, when we make the keyhole gardens with people, we don't use these types of things. You have to imagine this is a banana stem. Can you all do that? The string is just string, and this is a brick or a stone from something around. So these are our locally available materials. Because one of the things that we're doing um, is encouraging people to work with locally available materials, the low external input approach that's already been mentioned. So when we, when we make gardens, uh, we don't expect people to have rulers, so we ask them to measure out um, 
a rough size of a keyhole garden, the way that we're going to make it. So Daniel measures out his, is that your meter or so? A bit more. My meter's smaller than his meter because he's a bit bigger than me. So we get people to measure out, um, to make a, a basket in the middle. So in the middle of the keyhole is a compost basket. So it's a slightly different idea. So yeah, this is bamboo or sticks or bricks with holes between whatever you have available. And in the middle, we build up a basket of compost. And this is measured out from a central point using the radius of about, well, half a meter would be the maximum. So something a bit smaller because the emphasis is on the principles of the garden that's going to be compost in the middle. It's got to be big enough that the compost can really work, that we can get compost in the middle but um, not so big that you end up having to dig out the middle. So there's a guideline, 30 centimetres up to 50 centimetres will be the radius. And then double that distance out to the edge of the garden. So I'm holding the middle. So you have to imagine this is a stick. We are doing that with the farmers. It's like a big stick. And we are marking on the soil, like this with a stick, the shape of the garden. And we are going to... Don't do it, but you have to imagine it's the circle. Yeah, we didn't it's have quite enough space. Yeah, it's a little big. <laughs> it's good enough. Yeah, no, it's I'm not holding the middle very well. So we make two circles. So the keyhole aspect of it is going to be the entrance point, which we mark with whatever materials we're using, so that there's an access way into the compost basket. And round the edge, to stop the soil from falling away, we put something else that we found, a Holford sponge, or whatever you happen to have. So the idea of these keyhole gardens is that the centre of the keyhole has got compost in it. And the, around the edge, we've heaped up soil, um, depending on what resources the farmer has. Sometimes the soil is mixed with other kind of uh, organic matter, compost. Um, if they don't have compost, maybe there's some slurry, something like that. So. The keyhole shape has an entranceway so that this centre basket can be used for making the compost, but it's also a place where the waste goes. So the kitchen waste goes into the basket and continues with the compost making. <laughs> Carry on, I'm stealing your part here the presentation. Um, what we share also with the people uh, is that uh, we, we, we are building the soil the vegetable bed in a slope mm -hmm. so that the nutrients from the compost leaks out to the whole bed and um, it also increases the surface of cultivation. If it's flat, it's not as big as if it's... Uh, yeah. Okay, so the beginning part, I'm sorry you didn't see the video, but that was about a bit about the purpose of why we're doing it. So. I'm going to move because I'm standing right in front of the screen there. So, as well as the purpose... Next slide. Um, then we think of the keyhole garden as something that introduces different principles. Now, in Sender Cow and in Green Dots, we're, we're keen that what we transfer to people is ideas about principles of ways of doing things, and not just practices. Because practices need to depend on the situation, they need to depend on the resources, including the labour, the land, um, the uh, ecosystem that's around. So we're working with people with principles. And these gardens, uh, keyhole gardens, have been great because they are able to, we are able to illustrate lots of the principles through them. So through the keyhole garden, we're looking at uh, soil conservation, we're looking at um, how we deal with slopes, how we maintain the soil around the edge, covering the soil for soil and water retention, mulching. We're looking at soil um, improvement through composting. So there's lots of different principles that are found just within this garden, which can then be shared and discussed about how do they apply to the other fields, how do they apply to other parts of the farm. But one of the things we're doing as well is um, looking at why, I said the purpose of the gardens, why we're doing these for nutrition. So we can then talk again about nutrition, household nutrition. How do we garden intentionally for good nutrition, say for the children, all year round? 
So there's lots of different things that can be discussed, and that's why um, we wanted to use this garden as an example, because we use it also with some of our uh, peer farmers as a training tool, as a talking tool for them to then discuss with other farmers in the community about what we're doing and uh, what principles are good to use on the farm. The, another thing that we also introduce is pest management through integrated pest management. And we look at rotations. You can even do rotations on one of these gardens and discuss those. So there are principles of the garden. <laughs> and then there are principles also um, about the system of the garden. It's a, it's a little system containing lots of other little systems, but to us it's just part of the whole farming system. And as Sendercal, we're particularly interested in helping farmers, smallholder farmers, to improve their farming system. And this is, a, if you like it, this is just a subsystem. This is just a bit of the backyard gardening, which is part of their whole farm. And we work with farmers to achieve the ecological, social, and environmental goals that they want to achieve improving their farm in the way that they want to do it, which is another reason for introducing principles and not a set of practices. So, over, sorry, can we go back to that one? So, over time, um, some of these principles, as I hope you can see, have been transferred. I just wanted to show you that one. That's a really nice training poster that was done in Uganda on the left um, by a, f a friend of ours who has a company called Fourth Way, who did training posters developed with Ugandan artists, which, as you can see, was when we got the chance to go to Bangladesh, um, was developed there into a more culturally appropriate version. And if you look at the bottom, you can see that the garden is slightly different as well. And in a minute, we'll explain why that is too. At the bottom, there were three pictures that also showed that the farmer changes and adapts and learns things. And uh, you. Perhaps, sorry, Walter, because you go back. You can see that um, her farm progressed from, everyone had a sort of garden, a raised garden in that area where flooding happened, but she developed it in her own way. And as you can see at the end, she's grown, um, I think these are bottle of water, um, all the way from the top of the house right out into the, into wow. the garden. So. <coughs> so we've done all this also through partnerships. And we work, as you can see, uh, Daniel and I are working for two different NGOs. We've worked with different donors. But especially we work with different groups of farmers. We work with communities through a, a peer farmer strategy as well. And we've worked across different disciplines with health sector, with agriculture <coughs> sector. And the importance of that is to do more and more networking. And that's something that I think is really important about being in a place like this today and tomorrow is networking and learning from each other. I've made points from the last two um, uh, presentations that I want to follow up on. So this is an example I'm here from Potaba in Ethiopia. Um, this is a project that was implemented by a number of uh, two different donors and uh, send a cow, a local NGO, and some farmers groups. And this farmer here, whose name is actually Kabata, he developed uh, his own gardens. He liked the, uh, the principles of the keyhole garden, but he wanted to make it his own. And some of his neighbors started what they called Kotoba gardens, which were like elongated versions with places you could walk in and out and reach the compost heaps. And then he went one better, and there are even Kabata gardens, which are all on corners and go round houses. So to me, that's a really good example of how people take something and they own it, and it becomes theirs instead of just replicating a practice. Daniel? Yeah, that's the, it's the, the way that people take the garden take the garden and make them their, their own is free of use in Bangladesh. Because uh, the, 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 the objective for us in Bangladesh was to adapt those keyhole gardens to the flood prone areas, where, where like people cannot grow vegetables during four to six months. <laughs> A year because of the floods and the tidal surges, <coughs> so we we just um, observed how they do with the houses. They raise them on clay plate, so we decided to try and do the same with the gardens. 
And um, what, what happened is that the, the first trial garden we did was uh, really like a pile of dumb, really, it didn't look pretty at all. But the people had taken um, this technique and made absolutely beautiful garden. On the, on the website of the conference, you can see the, the link to a video that we made with Sheila in, uh, in the north of Bangladesh. And you can see a village where there are a lot of those gardens, but they are really nicely done. And for me, it's really important because it, it shows that the people care about the garden and they kind of like those gardens. And that makes them take care in producing more food. So it's kind of related. Um, so we have moved to Burkina Faso and Niger. That's also two other countries we have adapted those gardens with completely different challenges, obviously. Like in the Sahelian region, we have uh, no water, so the, the challenge is uh, the water, the availability of water to be able to garden all year round. So we are promoting techniques such as uh, mulch. Uh, we recycle the gray water into the compost. Uh, we are trying to do those things to, to have to, to cope with the lack of water. Um, Okay, so that was a bit um, beyond going out into some newer countries. So Burkina Faso and Niger were quite small projects compared <coughs> to some of the ones in East Africa, um, where keyhole gardens have been used. And in Southern Africa, in Lesotho, if you go online, you will find quite a lot about keyhole gardens there, built up with the stones, which in the beginning were a locally available resource in the community where the keyhole gardens were being built specifically for elderly people. So they were raised and they were made of local stone. But that's not appropriate even in every part of Lesotho. So it's a case again of the transferring the principles. In some parts of Lesotho, stone is really hard to get, believe it or not. It's really expensive. It's a, a highly sought after building material. So again, we ask people to find what they can and not to try and just copy a practice. So going beyond the keyhole garden, obviously smallholder sustainable agriculture is much more than a keyhole garden. That's just a little element, it's part of a system. And uh, we'll talk for hours later if you want to ask about other things. But that's something that we were um, wanting to share about today. So we are about improving the systems the small subsystems that make up the whole farm system, so that somebody's livelihood is improved, so that the environment around the farm is improved, so that their income is improved, and that there's equity and social fairness in the house. And we do this through learning the principles from the garden and balancing the people, the livestock, the agriculture, the environment. So I think this fits also with what I was hearing this morning about the permaculture ethics and principles and it's a really good fit, even though our organisation is not a permaculture one. I think we're walking the same path as you. So I'm very glad to be here. If you keep an eye on this, which will go through high speed, there's a step-by-step -step version of building a garden. I'm sorry, you didn't see the Burkina Faso. So, yeah, just if you want to see the, 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 the movie of Burkina Faso, you can uh, search on YouTube uh, Keyhole Garden Burkina. And if you are interested to building or trying to build a keyhole garden, I just want to, to tell you, try and look for the videos of Send the Cow on YouTube, because some people are, are, have posted things that they haven't understand the principles. So be careful of the source of uh, information that you get on the internet, because there are all sorts of things. And I'm not working for Send the Cow, so it's just no, uh, okay. honest <laughs> sharing. So yeah, you can see, uh, as we haven't had the, the visual of Burkina, you can see the visuals of uh, gardens in Bangladesh. That's a demonstration garden that we did. That's it. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila and uh, Daniel. I think we'll use uh, a few minutes of our tea time for questions. So we can have uh, uh, just a few questions. And there's already one uh, from the back. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, of all the technologies that improve soil 
and your vegetables, the amount of yield you can grow in a small space. I was wondering, two, two things really, why did you choose one technology above all the others, and, and why specifically people come in that? Okay, we don't actually choose and use one technology. We wanted to just use this, sorry, it was a bit confusing, not clear at the beginning. Um, but we wanted to use the keyhole garden as a way to illustrate one of the ways that we go into working with smallholder farmers. The keyhole garden is a good garden to use because you can illustrate a lot of different gardening principles, farming principles. Um, it's good to have it near the house, so in this zone that's really near to the house, because we found when we did some evaluations in Western Kenya, the women there told us that the main reason they really actually liked these productive little gardens by their home was that they lasted almost all year round, and that if they were late from the garden or late from, from being out somewhere, they had food right there by the kitchen, and that was really important if they didn't want to get into trouble. Uh, they said it more uh, dramatically than that. But, so the key thing for them was to have this kind of productive, and they are quite productive, gardens where they could put waste in from the kitchen and they're plucking the food off directly to the kitchen. So it's this little mini system going on right by the kitchen. Does that answer you? We do use lots of other different types of vegetable garden. And if someone's got really deep, lovely soil, we're not going to tell them to spend lots of time heaping it up because they could be doing other sorts of vegetable garden. But this is one that we've used where people have limited space, or whether like in Lesotho, the garden is near the home and there's no topsoil, it's a swept, clean, rocky area, this type of thing. So it's a tool for particular occasions. Thank you very much, yes. Uh, yeah, well, I was uh, sort of along the same lines. I was, I was curious, actually, because my experience in the field of trying to get people to do compost is that mm -hmm. they always give the waste to their animals. People actually use, will they compost? Do yeah. They give the, the food waste to their pigs or their, because I could never get people to do compost. Going back to the, it's easier to put animals in the world. I mean, it does depend. That, I mean, if, if you look at a system with a farmer and you discuss what resources are there, what they want to do, and how they want to do it, then there are priorities that they'll have, and you can suggest options to them. And if they want to feed the pigs and have a pig production part, you know, process, then that, that's their choice. And with the resources they've got, if it's sensible, then you help them, support them, whatever bottlenecks or things they haven't got, to go with that. But if they want to do some vegetables, and often the programs we've been working in has been looking at child nutrition, having vegetables by the house year round, this type of thing, then we encourage them to at least the peeling straight out of the kitchen or the waste at the end of the uh, the end of the day goes in there, and the grey water goes in there. Mm -hmm. So it does. Well, I mean, they are doing it. Yes. Yes. For example, so in Bangladesh, uh, we, we we found that you could use the water in heightened of the plants. So mm -hmm. there are this highly invasive plant that is uh, like a perfect material for compost. Yeah. That is uh, asphyxiating the plants, so uh -huh. we can. Look at the problem as a resource right. and use it. So use that. That's an ideal situation. It doesn't always work like no. this so easily, but that was kind of a like, solution. I think we'll have the final three questions. One, two, and yeah, the, the final two. Yes, uh, Bridget? Um, just the name, send a cow. I don't see the relationship with what we've been seeing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, um, I would encourage you to check out the Send a Cow website, it's just sendacow.org. Um, Send a Cow started by originally sending cows in 1988 to Uganda, literally putting them on planes, that's airplanes, and sending them at a time when the UK had just introduced milk quotas and people culling off perfectly good animals, and the conflict in Uganda was just finished. And Ugandan, uh, it's actually a Ugandan bishop said, what are you doing, can't you just send them to us? And a group of farmers, probably there were no development workers there because they would have squashed it right at the beginning. A group of farmers said, yeah, why not? And did it. Um, and now it has developed, so that was in 1988, and taken on also we do sustainable agriculture, we do gender and social development, and some elements of microfinance. So it's now a holistic uh, livelihoods program, but we retain the name because it's quite unforgettable when you know it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, the
Last question.